There was one rabbi who wanted to go on a piece of grand tourism. He wanted to see both heaven and hell. And God said, I wouldn't advise it. He said, no, this is what I really want to see. I want to see heaven and hell. So he suddenly he found himself standing in front of a door, a great door. And the door opened while he waited and he drew in his breath because there was a hall and there was a table and there were people sitting round the table. In the middle of the table, there was a great bowl of boiling stew or goulash or something like that. And all the people had, each one had a great spoon, but the spoons were so large that long that when they put them in the goulash, they couldn't get the spoons to their mouths. So they were absolutely fainting with hunger while all that plenty was in the midst of them. They were screaming with hunger, screaming with pain. And the rabbi said, take me away from this place. And God said, well, that was hell. And the rabbi said, I never want to see a place like that again. And he said, very well, I'll show you something else. And the rabbi suddenly found himself in front of a great door. And the door opened. And the rabbi was just about to scream again. Because in the room, he saw exactly the same setup. There was the same table. There was the same bowl of boiling stew. There were the same people. And there were the same spoons. But before he could scream, he noticed one difference. This time the people were full, they were happy, they were rejoicing, they were laughing. And what was the, how did this come about? Because instead of feeding themselves, they were using the long spoons to feed each other. And that was the only difference between heaven and hell. I've always been fascinated by the business of journeys because I've never really felt at home anywhere quite. And I've never thought of home as something stable, or something which has always been there. And life is, I suppose, for me a journey. So I always feel, not exactly contented, but I always feel right on a journey. And trains were part of my earliest childhood. They marked all the great changes in my life. You see, I always remember, for example, lining up for the train which took me off in 1939, you know, to evacuation. And I parted from my grandparents in the Yiddish-speaking world in East London that I knew. And uh, my grandmother was so worried that I'm, not merely my body might be in danger, but my soul might be damned as well, that she packed an enormous rucksack, you know, full of kosher knives, forks, spoons, plates, and so much food that when I stood up, I just fell over. My grandparents came from Eastern Europe and I lived in a little bit of Eastern Europe in London in my childhood. It was a very cosy world. There was a great deal of love in it, but also it was a medieval world. The world I lived in with my grandparents at their home was the world of the Middle Ages, which they'd brought from Russia and Poland. And we still lived with a religious clock. We lived from festival to festival, and each festival was punctuated with its own special foods, its own special smells, its own special flavours. There's a certain sort of old world Jewish smell of uh, cinnamon and sweet wine and candle grease. I used to sometimes feel that I knew more about the world than my grandparents because they only knew this one world this Yiddish world from Eastern Europe. But even as a child, I already knew more than they did. And I could see it not just from the inside, but also from the outside. And I was curious as a child about the people who wandered across the frontiers, because there were frontiers there. You see, when we came back from school, there were Jewish streets and there were Christian streets. And you had to work out the way you went from school to home, because you couldn't go through the streets of the other tribe as it were. But I was curious always as to what was on the other side, you know, of that border. 
For poor people, food is very important. It's the staff of life. And to give a person a meal in a poor society means that you're giving them your substance. And the nice thing about the East End of London that a great deal of food was in fact given. Food was also the thing which separated us you know, from our neighbours. Jews and Christians were divided by food. Uh, you see, we could never eat a lot of the foods that they ate and uh, they felt rather queasy when they ate our foods too. But I got to know Christianity eventually because I was blown into it. It was in the Blitz and I'd come back to London for the Blitz because we thought there might be an invasion my parents wanted me with them. The shelters of London were a great mixing pot never knew in the rush down to the shelters who you were going to park next to. Families chose the same spot you know, for day after day, for week after week, so you found yourself with a new, completely new set of neighbours. And all sorts of people who I had just known about in the East End, but I'd never really met, I suddenly got to know very well. You know, the Irish families who were there, you know, there was a Hindu astrologer I knew existed about two streets away, but uh, we met each other in the shelters. And, you know, when our house was blown up, because the first thing you did was after the um, bombs were over at night and you went out of the shelters early morning, you went to see if your house was still standing. Well, one day we came out and our house wasn't. And we got a little wheelbarrow and sort of uh, piled the stuff on it and, you know, to a lock-up and all the neighbours came, whatever their religion, you know, to help us. There was a, a great deal of mutual help at the time. So all the frontiers blew up during the war and something blew up within me too. You know, I knew we could never recreate them again. Hello, Lionel. Hello, Gordian. Very nice to see you. Well, that's Gordian. His father, Gordian, really. And he's a Dominican. I suppose he's my mate. Uh, we got to know each other through some lectures to novices many years ago. That's actually how I wrote my first book, you know, explaining Judaism to novices. But we clicked. And I've always found that with Gordian that this integrity of his is a kind of touchstone for me because one of the biggest difficulties in religion and especially in professional religion is to try and work out what's genuine and what's phony. What was the journey like, Donald? Oh, it was absolutely lovely. I felt like a child released from school, you know, just looking at the fields. It's another England. You know, different from my neck of the woods, Gordian. Oh, I've got so a break from the office for a few days. Oh, that's where I've come up, you know, from, from me. And we've got a nice little bit of... Um, Christian contemplation, nice monastic silence for me, you know, well, do, stuff. I'm not sure how much silence we can give you. Are you planning to cook for us this time? Oh, why shouldn't we have a treat? What should I make What you? would you do? Well, if you tell me what you're going to make, we can get some, the things in for you. Yeah. I'll make you a good East European Jewish, you know, sweet sour beetroot soup, you know, with all the companies, all the trimmings. Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. I'd love that. I think that'd be nice too. But, Gordia, you know, that's the treat. OK, fine, but... I will tend to come up on business as one of the things you know. I see things in Christianity which exist in, in Judaism too, but I see them in a new light. And then a lot of my work deals with you know, mixed marriages, conversions and that sort of thing. You've got to think in terms of human beings and, and it's terribly important for me that I can see both sides. Oh, 
Crossbow Priory is a vast, vast pile set up in the days when great fortunes were made, you know, out of the potteries in this area, and in the great days of Catholic triumphalism, when you try to dazzle everybody with your material and your spiritual wealth and all your goodies that you had. And it still reminds me of an Oxford college or an English public school. And when I see it from afar, I sometimes get the shivers because I don't like institutions. But as you get nearer, you find that time has played a kind of trick on it, that the grandeur has collapsed. You know, there's a coal mine underneath so the place is sinking. And also there's only a few um, fathers and brothers you know, living in it now. And there's a tremendously friendly, nice lot of people running it. Oh, hello, Father oh, Joe. How are you? Nice to see you again. Lovely. Nice to be here. Thank you. The feeling is now like that of a home. And I can't help thinking of Jews, you know, when I go to Spode, because Jews also had their uh, triumphalism and, um, you know, stripped away from them. And history has forced them to be very human. And I think the same thing has happened to Spode. No, they're Dominicans, but in the sort of way that I regard them as honorary Jews. So, if you'd like to settle and come down yeah. for a cup of coffee when you're ready. Yeah, really nice. See you, you later. Touch, indeed. When I first came to Spurred, I used to get rather worried because it's a bit frightening going into the centre of another religion. You know, you get a bit worried, are you going to keep your own, are you going to get endangered, and all that sort of thing. And the Catholic presence is very, very strong here in the um, Habits of the Monks, where the crucifix is in every room. And at first it's, it worried me a lot. But I found that I don't have to worry, because... The strange thing is that contact with Christianity, for me, usually makes me a much better, stronger Jew afterwards. I think, first of all, that a lot of my own Judaism comes back to me very fresh. If you're religious, not merely religious, you also earn your living from your own religion, you know, you say the words over and over again. And then you come into a group of people like this for whom all these words are fresh, and, and they want to hear them from you. And somehow, by telling them, you know, about yourself and your religion, then you and your religion freshen up. So that's very important to me. Judaism is a portable religion. It's been like that ever since the temple was destroyed. And the rabbis arranged that you could put the whole of Judaism, really, in a little suitcase, and you could take it all over the world. You know, my grandparents brought it from Russia and Poland to England, and I can take my Judaism quite nicely in my little case and take it into a Christian priory. When I come to my own prayers, I like my Jewish way of praying. I don't really like kneeling or prostrating or anything like that. You know, I like facing God standing up from my own space, in my own way. You know, and though I'm an English Jew, I suppose a bit assimilated, when I pray, I go back to the world of my grandparents very much. A bit of me starts swaying, I start reading Hebrew, you know, in the old manner. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu velehe avotenu elahe Avraham velohe Yitzchak velohe Yaakov el hagadol hagibor v'hanora el elyon gomil chasadim tovim kone hakol Hello, Isabel. How are you? Okay, thanks. What have you got there? 
This is a fascinating book. It's yeah. liturgical hymns by Thomas Aquinas, the Dominican. Oh, yeah. One of the things I like about Dominicans is they've got a good library. These hymns have been translated into Greek and Italian, so you good can learn Lord. all three languages. Well, I think both for Jews and Dominicans, you know, one of the ways you come to God is through religious study. You know, not study to get a diploma or a degree or with an exam or that sort of thing, but what makes it holy is because it's study for study's sake. Okay, thanks very much. Until then. <laughs> if you can. Okay. When I come to this library, I feel rather like a little child let loose, you know, in a, in a sweet shop. You know, there's all these goodies all around. I rush from book to book, here, there, and everywhere. And there's all sorts of treasures here. Um, and I love the books, you know, which obviously nobody's looked at for years and years and years because the most extraordinary things in them. I remember I was going through these books some time ago and I found a little volume, you know, tucked away. It was um, the thoughts of a brother Lawrence who had been a cook in his time, which was centuries ago, and he really expressed the soul of a cook and the spiritual aspirations, you know, of a cook. And he talked about the presence of God and the presence of God which comes to you, you know, when you're slicing vegetables in the kitchen and how close God can be. And I've always treasured that book. I remember I got a copy, my own copy, uh, but it was very important to me because that little book helped unify the life of my little chores that I have to do every day, you know, and the great mystical heights of all religion. I think the most important thing when I cook for other people is the feeling that I've got a family. And when you cook a meal for people, you create a home. One of the things I always liked about Spode very much was that it had so many of the qualities of my grandparents' home. First of all, it was a generous sort of place. You know, you came in and people immediately made you a cup of coffee or tea. and then they didn't just invite you in, you know, to please come along and be with us at Mass. But they said, look, come into the kitchen you know, and say, would you like a little bit of this down? Or would you like a little bit of that? This was so much the world of the generous and poor East End that it felt like home. Yeah, you know, Dominicans are a rather odd order for a Jew to take to. You know, the Jewish Dominican history has not been of the best. As fast as the rabbis are writing the town, but they burnt it. What we would have done to them if we had the power, and they were the underdogs, I, I don't know, but I wouldn't like to think about that either. I mean, there was very little love lost in the Middle Ages. And sometimes, when I first got here, I had the normal Jewish fear of people walking around in monkish robes. Yes, I love some of the bits and pieces. Thank you. You see, you have to cross a lot of frontiers in yourself to go out to meet another religion, and especially between Jews and Christians, because it's been a tangled past, and it's really been like a family row, and family rows can be very, very bitter. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing with Spode is that it's rather like a family for me. There's a very gentle atmosphere here, and I know that if ever I should be in trouble, in great difficulty, I just take the first train back here. Clean or dirty. We live in a pluralist society now, and religions in the past, well, we haven't been kind to each other or nice to each other. Although we're each other's neighbours, we certainly haven't loved our neighbours as ourselves. But I feel when I come here and with my growing friendship with um, Father Gordian and many others, 
you know, I feel that sort of old wounds are being healed, that all those dreadful, dreadful splits and bad things which were said, which have existed between Judaism and Christianity since, I suppose, the destruction of the temple, you know, that all this is being exorcised, that the ghosts are gradually going away. The kindness and generosity of God is coming into the situation. You know, I come here normally by train, but sometimes I feel that uh, I've been blown along here by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Lots of people get very frightened at the unknown. You know, it's an unknown religion. Well, I can only say that for myself, there's nothing to fear. If your own faith is deeply based, and, and mine is, then all that can happen is that their faith can enrich yours and yours can enrich them.